Hi everybody, hope you're well. Uh, today I will read from a book titled Lessons from the Social Condensers, 101 Soviet Workers' Clubs and Spaces for Mass Assembly by Anna Bokov, published by Getia Verlag. This project examines the concept of the social condenser, a building typology conceived specifically to promote Soviet culture in the early 20th century, as manifested in the Soviet Union's workers' clubs, palaces of culture and other spaces for mass assembly. Originally envisioned as an instrument of social engineering, this typology tests the agency of architecture as collective infrastructure, not only to shape individual behaviors, but also to reform society at large. While the idea of social condensers is deeply rooted in the discipline of architecture, it must also be considered through the lenses of society, politics, ideology, economics and culture. The term social condenser was coined by constructivist architects in the 1920s and popularized internationally beginning in the 1960s by Anatole Kopp, Henri Lefebvre, Kenneth Frampton and, in particular, Ram Koolhaas. Constructivists sought to introduce a new social type in which all the elements and parts of a building, without exception, stem from their social and technical function. This modernist dictum was to be applied to a range of architectural and urban structures including communal housing, workers' clubs, houses of labor, administrative buildings and even factories. While all these diverse typologies were conditioned to become conductors and condensers of socialist culture, the mandate was most consistently manifested, tested and interpreted through two groups of buildings, workers' clubs and palaces or houses of culture. This category of public cultural facilities offered a vast platform for experimentation, as not just their form, but also their function, was a subject of intense professional polemic in the 1920s. Both built and unbuilt, these projects presented a wide variety of spatial and programmatic solutions, often deploying dynamic and expressive spatial language. Their architecture was meant to conduct and condense a host of collective activities. Social Condenser expanded the canonical modernist formulas of form follows function by envisioning an architecture where form would presumably follow a larger purpose. First and foremost, the new typology sought to fulfill a utopian mission its entire programmatic composition and spatial organization were intended to condition social behavior through a series of orchestrated collective experiences. Beyond specializing manifold activities, social condensers sought to create a space between, not just between walls, but between architecture and life. As such, these projects did not simply aim to provide spatial forms for the new mode of life, but ostensibly to condition the life that would subsequently unfold in them. The utopia of architecture as project might be progressive in its ends or nostalgic in its dreams, but at heart it was founded on this premise that the shape of environments might, like nature herself, affect and hereby control the individual and collective relations of men, writes architectural historian Anthony Widler. In focusing on the relationship between architecture, society and politics, this volume seeks to bring to the fore a significant but largely overlooked body of works that was both shaped by and helped shape the culture of the former Soviet Union. The combined focus on functional organization, the formal language of individual projects and the larger territorial networks and urban contexts of those projects allows the numerous historical sources, including the period discussions that accompanied the development of this body of architectural work, to be unpacked. Analyzing the somewhat cryptic morphology of social condenser architecture and its various embodied manifestations reveals underlying economic initiatives and cultural agendas. 
The study investigates the programmatic, organizational and architectural qualities of the typology as a whole, while also presenting focus histories of select projects. Social condensers were a central theme for the architecture of the period. Nearly every design-related periodical in the Soviet Union from the mid-1920s through the early 1930s featured something on workers' clubs, palaces of culture or mass action theatres, whether a richly illustrated editorial or a tangential mention, a faculty project or a student competition. The buildings and projects included in this study are spread across the territory of the former Soviet Union, from Kiev to Kharkiv in Ukraine to Yekaterinburg in the Urals, from Moscow and Leningrad in central Russia to Erevan and Baku in the Caucasus. Some of the surviving buildings are still actively used, others languish in a state of decrepitude. Some continue to operate as originally intended, others have been adapted for new functions or have been drastically reconstructed. Some have fallen apart after decades of neglect, others were damaged by warfare or demolished to make room for new developments. Some have been recognized as important parts of the cultural heritage and gained landmark status. Others carry the stigma of the totalitarian regime that constructed them. The survival and future use of these monuments of the bygone socialist era are precarious, as they symbolize aspirations that are no longer relevant to the present day or are outright unwelcome. The goal of this study is to unpack the notion of the social condenser by proposing a typological organization, a taxonomy of the projects. The organizational structure of this volume reflects the historical development of the social condenser typology and, at the same time, traces the way it functioned as a social and spatial institutional network. Taxonomy is addressed through a series of questions. What is a social condenser and what ideology underpins it? How did the social condenser originate and change over time? What was its program and how did it function? What was its purpose and how was it manifested? What did the social condenser look like and how did people use it? How did it relate to its context? What architectural challenges were overcome by its design and what formal innovations did it usher in? What was envisioned and what was eventually realized? Who were the clients, the architects and the users? Ask for the book at your local bookstore. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video. Bye.